If you turn in your Bibles with me to First Peter, um, we are going to jump back into this into this series to um, to do exactly what Sharon said to to hear about what what Peter taught as or what Peter learned as he was taught by Jesus. Um, I want to remind us, um, all of us, especially the students and and, and other people, that um, Peter's writing to people just like us, right? People who never got to meet Jesus face to face. For us, it was because you know it's been about two thousand years, so I don't think any of us are, are that old. Um, but even for the people in in Peter's day, they weren't in the right spot, and they were also a little bit um, a little bit too young, like most of you. All, all of you. <laughs> that was an innocent mistake. Um, so what Peter says in this letter to all these people who haven't um, haven't actually met Jesus, but who have, who have heard this preaching, he, he says that we are saved by what Jesus did when he died on the cross and God raised him from the dead. But that more than this, more than this salvation, there is more for them, more for us than what we experience now. Right? When, when we come to believe in Jesus, Peter says that we are born again. And being born again means we have a, a whole new life. Right? Just like a, a little baby has a whole new life ahead of them, so when, when every Christian is born again, we are given a new future. So when we believe in Jesus, when we trust for what, what he did for us on this cross, this really is just the beginning of our new life. Sometimes we, we think about um, sharing the gospel with people like, like this is the, the very end of what we need to do, but really that's just that's just the beginning. Um, and so Peter is writing to remind his people, to remind us how to live now for Jesus. So let's read what Peter wrote in this Bible. Let's let's read what he um, what he learned from Jesus. So today we, we will read from chapter one, from verse thirteen through verse twenty one. So if you're there with me in your Bibles, this is First Peter, um, chapter one, starting at verse thirteen. He says this. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, back when you didn't know any better. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially, that's without any favoritism, if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to everyone's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways or empty ways inherited from your forefathers, ransomed not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. It was like uh, that of a lamb without blemish or without spot. Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, God who raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. And all of these things so that your faith and your hope are in God. This is God's word. And so what, what we want to do as we come to God's word is we want to read it so that we might understand it, not just what it says, but if you guys remember from the last time we had a, a school holiday, there were three things we wanted to figure out each time we come to the Bible. So the, the first thing is, what does it say? The second thing is, what does it mean? And the third is, why does it matter? And so Peter's actually kind of been doing this. He's been talking about the gospel. He's been doing his own um, what does what does the Bible say? But now Peter's really going to press in, and he's going to do the work for us. He's going to tell us what it means and why it matters. So let's let's uh, dig in and start looking at at what Peter says to us. How many of you have ever been in a race? I know some people have done cross country at school. I grew up doing cross country. Yeah, I was a I was a runner in high school. So every, every Saturday morning from August to November, I would run a 5K with my team. And from Monday to Friday, we would prep for that race. We would train and get ourselves ready for the race on Saturday. And on Saturday morning, we would all get to the, the race course early, and we would walk the course to see what it was like. There were a lot of different things we wanted to know about the course. Right? Where are the hills? 
we had less in America than you have here in New Zealand, but we still needed to be aware if there were any of those. Where are the hills? Where are the best places to pass people? Uh, and my, my favorite thing to look out for, where at the end of the race should you start uh, to kick it into the finish? Kind of kick it into high gear and give everything else that you've got. So today, Peter really is telling us to think ahead just like my team and I used to before every race. But instead of looking at the, the finish line at the end of a race, Peter wants us to look forward to the end of our lives, right? He says, set your hope on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ is revealed. Peter wants us to keep our, our eyes fixed on the goal, on, on everlasting life. And ju just like us, Peter's readers had to face many different kinds of problems. Just like us, the culture around Peter's readers, these believers, the culture around them was pressuring them to act like everyone else. So for us, Peter is saying that, that we need to keep our eyes fixed on the end. This is what he means when he commands us to set our hope on a future grace. Well, how do we do this? That's the big question I want to know. How do we do this? Peter says that we should set our hope on the future. But what does this mean? How do we do this? Well, Peter tells us two ways that we set our hope on Jesus Christ. First, he says to get our minds ready for action. Right? If you're going to run a race, you need to tie your shoes. And this is what Peter says here. He says, tie the shoes of your mind. It's kind of a funny picture. We don't have shoes on our heads. But Peter says to tie the shoes of your mind. Get ready to run this race. Right? Be, be alert and keep your eyes on the future. Second, Peter says to be sober-minded. So first, you, you, get, you, you lace up your shoes and you get ready to run. And the next thing is to clear your mind. When you're on the starting line and the, the gun for the race is about to go off, you really aren't thinking about anything else. You're just waiting for the, the gun to go and for you to start running. Don't be distracted by anything else, Peter says. Being sober-minded means thinking clearly. It means being well-balanced. And the, the Christians who run this race the best, you know, there are many in this room who are just amazing examples of Christian maturity. The, the, the people who run this race the best are the Christians who are well-balanced, the Christians who are sober-minded. So what does this mean for us today? What does it mean for you who are students at Maharangi College or Horizon or anywhere else? What does this mean? Well, first, when, when Peter tells us to hope, he tells us to prepare our minds for action. He tells us to keep our, our thoughts well-balanced. And this means that the hope that he's talking about, it's not, it's not a feeling. You know, hope isn't just wishing that you will do well in the race or, or hoping that you'll do good on an exam. Hope is, the hope that Peter's talking about is, is like studying well for this exam. The hope that he's talking about is training hard for a race. Peter tells us to set our hope on the future by, by being careful about all of our thoughts. We set our hope on Jesus when we can point out all the distractions in our life and then put them to the side so that we're looking just at him. There are things all around us that distract us as Christians. Some of them are, are really important, but they are they're still distractions, right? What, what, what kind of things dis distract us normally from keeping our focus on Jesus Christ? but from keeping our, our focus on the promise that we have of this eternal life with him. Are we distracted by our friends or by school? We could be distracted by our job or even our families, right? These things that are good things, but sometimes these things will, will take our eyes off of heaven and force them down here to earth, and so we start to get caught up in all of the things that we have to do here instead of setting our hope on the, the grace that will be ours, knowing that one day the Lord will come in and, and redeem this world so that all of the troubles that we experience, all of these distractions, he will take care of. Friends, we are, we are waiting for the greatest joy that will ever be experienced by any human. We are promised to live forever with God in a world where all the brokenness we see around us will be redeemed. And, and we will be with God forever. So why are we so easily distracted by all these things around us? Instead of the, the state of this world, all the, the brokenness we see around us, we should be setting our mind on Christ, tuning our thoughts into Jesus, 
We should prepare our minds to run the race until Christ returns or calls us home. We need to keep our minds sober, Peter says, well-balanced, to fix our eyes on the grace that is coming to us when Jesus comes again. So what then? Right? Should, should we as Christians just pack up and leave? If we're supposed to set our hope on the future, does that mean we just leave this world to fall to pieces? Not at all. And I think, I think a lot of you understand that. Not, not at all. Peter actually says that if we wait for the future, if we're putting our hope in heaven, this will change everything about how we live here and now. Right? Hope changes our habits. Our belief always changes our behavior. How we think about the next life will change how we treat others in this one. If we know that we are saved by grace, we will give grace to other people. If we have received the mercy from God in Jesus Christ, we will extend mercy to other people. If we have seen the Lord take care of the greatest injustice in the world, we will work to cure injustice here as well. If we have our hope in heaven, we will not live for the things of this world, but that doesn't mean we leave this world alone. Because if we have been born into a new life, we can't live the same way we used to. If we have such a powerful Savior and an eternal reward, we won't chase rewards here on earth or be overwhelmed when this world breaks down. That's the, that's the beauty of setting our hope on heaven. Because this world can be as bad as it has been for the last 2,000 years since Jesus came and, and, and broke down the power of sin. But we can still set our hope on heaven. We don't have to get bogged down by this world. I don't know how anyone without the hope of heaven has, has been able to go through the last few years or the last few centuries. It's been horrible times. The 20th century was not a very happy century, and it's, it's really not looking up. But Peter describes a hope that we have, and this hope gives us a new way of living. And this is what he tells us in our passage today. He tells us that if our hope is in God, then we should look like God. Our eternal life does not mean we throw away this one. It means that we should live this life with the end in mind, right? Like a, like a runner at, at the starting line. You're, you're not sitting there not doing anything because the gun hasn't gone off. You're, you're sitting there waiting for the return of Christ, for the gun to go off and for the, the race really to start. Peter commands us to set ourselves apart for God while we live here in this world. To be holy, he says, in everything that we do. That means not just when we're at church, but in our jobs or at home or when we do homework. Holy in everything we do. If we have our hope set on heaven, we will live holy lives. So what, what sets Christians apart from everyone else? All right, aside from all the things that, that people you know, kind of get angry at us for, but what sets us apart from everyone else? If we, if we claim to have a different set of values than the world around us, would our, would our next door neighbors see that in our living? Would they understand just by looking at us that there's something different about us, that we are looking to a different future than, than they are? Can they see this different purpose in our lives? In, in just the next chapter, Peter is going to call us to suffer for the sake of Jesus. But in this century... The majority of Christians in a place like New Zealand look just like the person who lives next to them who doesn't know Jesus, who has no hope of eternal life. One author, as I was reading this week, she said this. Listen to what, listen to what she wrote. She said, the Christians to whom Peter is writing were suffering because they were living by different priorities and different values than their unbelieving neighbors. And then she asked the question, are, are Christians today willing to suffer isolation and anger from our society out of obedience to Christ? She goes on and says, if, if statistics tell this true story, it would seem that most Christians today, even those who call themselves born again or evangelicals, these people are in, are in some important ways not very different from unbelievers. We divorce at the same rate. We have the same addictions. We seek the same forms of entertainment. We wear the same fashions. But Peter challenges Christians to re-examine our acceptance of the culture around us. And Peter asks us to be willing to suffer 
wherever the culture's values are against the values of Christ. I think she raises a good point. I think actually it's, it's Peter who raises a good point. If Christians have been set apart by the Holy Spirit who, who lives inside of us, why do our values so often follow the values of the world? Peter tells us that to be obedient children of God, we need to reject the patterns of the way we used to live. This means that, that we throw away all of the actions and the attitudes and the ambitions of the culture around us. And instead, we need to be people who reflect the actions, the attitudes, and the ambitions of God. Especially that what, what God has shown us are his actions, attitudes, and ambitions in the person of Jesus Christ. Think about it. If we are, if we are set apart by God and we, just, we, we return to the way we used to live and we act like everyone else, how real is that salvation? How true is that conversion? How, how, how actually do you think the Spirit of God dwells in that person? How real do you think that must be? This is what holiness means. It means to be different then. So let me, let me illustrate this idea of being holy. Try and paint a picture right, of, of being set apart. Because every single one of us has something that we use every day that is really holy to us, I think. Something that we have all set apart for a very specific use. Let me ask you a question. How many, how many functions, how many jobs does your toothbrush do? Right? One. While, while you're using this toothbrush to brush your teeth in the morning and at night, it only has one job. It has no other function. Nobody who's preparing dinner goes to the bathroom to clean a potato with your toothbrush. Right? Nobody... Nobody who's in a rush for company to come over will go and scrub the bathroom floor and clean the toilet with the toothbrush they're going to use that night, right? The thought of this is ridiculous to us, but this is how we take our lives. With our lives that have been set apart by God for his purposes, we scrub potatoes, and we clean the toilet, and we, we pollute our lives with the filth of this world, the values, the attitudes, actions, and ambitions of this world. So what Peter calls us to do is to examine ourselves every single day, right? Keeping the, the mercy and the grace of God that has saved us on the cross in mind, we need to examine ourselves. When, in, in what ways might we be dirtying our lives, David said in, in Psalm 101, he said, I will not set anything before my eyes that is worthless. That's a, that's a pretty strong commitment to holiness, to being different. How committed to holiness are we as the people of God in this generation? And I, think, I think Christians today don't really like to talk about holiness. We don't like to talk about sin, or at least the sin in our own lives. Some Christians only want to focus on God as Father. As, a, as a, a loving father, he has made us his children, right? And so we should rest in this knowledge of him as father and not worry so much about getting things right. Rest in his presence. Soak up his love for you. God is a loving father. This is absolutely true. All of those things are right, but God has called us into this personal relationship with him, and there are, there are two things, Peter reminds us, that we need to remember. Two things that we can forget very easily that are really important to this relationship with God. And these two things actually make this relationship even more incredible. The first thing that Peter reminds us, he says in verse 17, he says, if you call him Father, who judges without favoritism, according to each person's actions, live with reverent fear. We don't normally put those two things together. God as Father and reverent fear. But this is exactly what Peter is reminding us. Peter reminds us that even though we have been given the privilege by God himself to call him Father, God is still the holy judge of all the world. He is still the creator, and he is completely different than us who are his creation. Isaiah calls God, he, he says, God is the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity whose name is holy, who inhabits eternity. 
God is so, so far above us that we cannot even begin to understand him. This is why, this is why the words we use to describe God are all negative. He is infinite, right? He is without beginning or end. Because of this, because God is holy, 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 God will one day judge all the world. And so even though he has called us his children, he has called himself our father, he stays holy. He doesn't sacrifice who he is to call us father. And this is what makes it even more amazing that we are now his children, right? Because we, we won't understand the privilege of being God's children by ignoring his holiness, in fact, the, the more we ignore his holiness, the cheaper it will become for us to be his children. The less we care about how great God is, the less it will matter to us that he has made us his children. And this is exactly what Peter is reminding us, that if we call on God as father, we should live with reverent fear because our father is the one who will judge. Our father is the one who sets the standard for all of righteousness. The joy and the privilege we experience in calling God Father is only ever as great as our understanding of his holiness. So that the more we come to understand God's holiness, the more we will know how much he loves us by calling us his children. The second thing that makes this relationship with God so amazing is how he makes us his children. All right, there's, a, there's another thing in this that helps, that helps us, gives us um, an impulse to reflect God's character. This is what Peter is trying to press in. He's telling his people why they should be holy. And this is the second reason he gives. And I think if, if anyone should hear this, it's all of you high school students. Because you students have to face more anti-Christian values than any of us today. Not many of us face seven to eight hours a day from mostly people who care nothing about Jesus or who are actually decidedly and determinedly against him. It's harder for you to live for Jesus in, in the hallways and the classrooms of school than, than for us who are working or living outside of these places. So I, th I think you especially need to hear why holiness matters. Because if, if your high school is anything like mine, being different is not always the best thing. At least it wasn't for me. Why should you think differently than all of your friends? Why should you not watch some of the things they watch or not listen to some of the things they listen to? Why should, why should your lives be any different than the lives of everyone else in your high school? Well, Peter tells us. This is the second reason. He says, because we have been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. Redeemed, Peter says. Like people who have been sold into slavery, we were slaves to sin. And, the, and slaves to the result of sin, which is death. But God, Peter says, purchased our freedom. He redeemed us, not with gold or with silver or cash or Bitcoin. All of these things can be destroyed. No, God, God bought our freedom with the precious blood of his son. And this blood has given us life. We have been bought from death and given new life. And this is the grace that we have now. This is why we should live holy lives. Because if you, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you have been joined to God the Father by the Holy Spirit because of the work of Jesus on the cross, this is the payment. Whether, whether we are at Maharangi College or the Maharangi Bowling Club, we should be different from people who do not have this hope. And we should live like it. Peter says to us that we should live differently than all the people around us. Differently than the way we used to live by being transformed by the Spirit of God. You know, Paul uses this, this same word, um, being conformed. He uses it in Romans 12, verse 2. Right? Do, not be, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If our hope is in God, our lives will put him on display in every area of our life. Becoming more and more like Jesus, being pressed into the mold of Jesus so that we look more like him. This is what Paul calls the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, right? A, a call to grow in holiness. And I'll be the first to admit, I have many moments where I lack any desire to pursue 
holiness. It, I, I would rather stay lazy. I would rather stay focused on what seems best for me, on what's easiest for me in the moment. I would rather ignore the people around me, ignore the God who calls me by his grace. But, but that's not what God has called us to. The, the upward call of holiness is upward. It's, there's a reason Paul says it's the upward call. Not only does it go up to God, but it's like going uphill. It's not natural. Left to ourselves, we go downhill. But if the Spirit of God lives in you, because you have put your trust in the work of Christ, he will give you the strength and the desire to look more like Jesus. You will grow in this day by day. People who claim to be Christians, but who do have no desire to grow in holiness, trick themselves. This is what we saw in, in 1 John last year, that uh, the Christians whose lives show no sign of holiness after two years or two decades of following Jesus or going to church, they've deceived themselves. And there's nothing more dangerous than being self-deceived, especially when we're talking about salvation. The point is this. Peter's passage of this sermon, the point is this. The world around us is broken. It's it's pretty clear. And every single one of us, we're a part of this brokenness. But if we have been saved by God, we have a new calling, a new end in mind. God calls us to look like him, to reflect his values like water reflects the sun, right? To be pressed into this mold of Jesus Christ so that we will look like him. It is not enough simply to believe that the Bible has a different understanding of of sexuality or justice if we do not extend ourselves to love the people who think differently. It's not enough for us to ask the world to be holy when they don't know God at all. We shouldn't expect them to behave like Christians. Don't get me wrong, we should never back down from the truth of what God has said about marriage or gender or race or justice, or even truth itself, which is under attack nowadays. But we should be people who are holy. And this means we reflect the character of God. That means when we disagree with others about sexuality, we should behave in such a way towards people we disagree with that the world has no leg to stand on. We shouldn't be people who are so bitter and mean that nothing we say actually comes across. We can disagree with people and still love them. We aren't holy because we are any closer to godliness than other people. We are holy because we've come to recognize that it is only by grace we have been saved, that God has set us apart by the work of Christ. We are holy because God made us holy. We don't live differently because we're better than anyone else. We live differently because we've been shown how broken we are. We live differently because we know that God has set a standard for our lives his own holiness, and he has bought our freedom with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Friends, don't don't let your holiness become something that this world can use against you. Let your holiness be like the holiness of Jesus. Jesus was the the perfect reflection of God's character. And he, he had his moments where he fought for truth. It's not gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He, he made a whip to drive people out of the temple who were worshiping incorrectly. But, but Jesus ate with sinners, right? Whether they were the, the self-righteous Pharisees, the, the cheating tax collectors, you know, these people in the high end of society, or the, the prostitutes and the lowly and the outcasts. He ate with everyone. Jesus lived his holy life among people. He didn't come and live alone in the desert. He brought the holiness of God to earth and put it on display in the darkest corners of our world. And if we are led by the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit of God who lives in our hearts, then we will follow his example. We have a hope. right? Jesus has been raised from the dead, and we will be with him forever in eternal life. And this hope changes how we live here. It has to, right? Because the God who called us to this hope is holy. Do we live like our neighbors? Or do we live like our hope is in this holy God? Can can the world around us see what is different? Do we shine 
in the darkest corners of this world, or have we just carried ourselves off to our own corner and made our own little bright space over here? We have been given the greatest gift and hope this world has ever known. So, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. Set your hope completely on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions that you had before when you didn't know any better, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because he said, be holy for I am holy. Heavenly Father, it is a a privilege to call you by that name. Lord, as we we look into your holiness, as, as we see who you are, your character, your goodness, your truth, your beauty, your righteousness, Lord, we are reminded that we have none of that on our own. Created to reflect who you are, we have broken the image of God in us. Created to be holy and set apart, Lord, we have, we have polluted our lives. But Lord, in your, in your grace, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, into this world. In the same flesh, in the same flesh and blood that, that we now have, and, and, and you sent him to live a perfect life and to die our death so that, that now we stand in his righteousness. And you don't look at our sin, but you look at Christ's life, that you have cast our sin as far away from us as the east is from the west. Your mercy is more than all we could ever do against you. God, would you, would, would you call us to radical faith in Jesus Christ? Or would you call us as, as Christians who have set our hope on a future where there, there is no sin to be people who live now, who root sin out of our lives? God, would you give us grace to live as, as shining lights in the dark corners of this world? Lord, protect us against, against um, pulling up and, and, and walking together apart from this world, but help us to follow the example of your son who was in and among the worst of this world. Who didn't let them stay the way they were. Everyone who came in contact with him, you changed Jesus Christ. But, but would you help us to be as he was, concerned for your holiness, but filled with your compassion. We pray this in in his name, the name that that the archangel will will declare when he comes from heaven on the clouds the way he left. Would you help us to look forward to this day when we will see our Savior, whether resurrected or already alive, and we will come to enjoy the fullness of life with you forever. In Jesus' name.